from MI, if you're game. And what that is going to uh, invite you to do is to speak to the person next to you. So if you don't have a person next to you, could you go find a partner if you want to participate in this? Because it'll make it a lot easier to talk to somebody who's near you. Yeah, take some of the space too so you're not on top of each other. That'd be great. Is there anybody who is without a partner who wants one? Raise your hand and then we're going to match you up. And you, you're going to need to be close to one another because we're going to be listening and talking, not just talking. So if you don't have a partner and you want one, please raise your hand. Saad is looking for a partner. So if not, I'm going to invite you to listen in to what happens in between your people who are closest to you. All right? So here are the instructions. Are you ready? The person who has the longest pinky finger is going to be the person who is the client. Well, I think we're clients in this. Oh, uh, wait, yeah. Wait a minute. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, the person who has the longest pinky finger is good. Is that what we're doing? That's oh, not what we're doing. Sorry, I lied. I lied. So, sorry, stand up. Stand up. The person who is the tallest, <laughs> with or without heels as you choose, you're going to stay standing up. So stand up, please. Stand up. The, the person who is the tallest is the person who's going to try to get their partner to open their hand. So the person who is the smallest is going to extend their hand towards their partner like this, a fist. And the tall person is going to try to get that fist open. You need to stand up because it's not going to be easy. So stand up and hold out your hand and let her rip. Go ahead. Get their hands open. Those are the instructions. Get their hands open. All right, who got somebody's hand open? Raise up your hands. Who got their hands open? All right, how did you do it? I asked if I could open their hand. You asked if they would open their hand or if you could open their hand. <laughs> Al, no, how did you do it? Oh, he, he petted her and she opened her hand. <laughs> who else got the hand open? Right, so you were still stuck in the, in the early parts and you didn't get a chance to do it. Cool. A anybody else who got the hand open? Yes, how'd you do it? There you go, and you, and you did. Anybody ask and didn't get the hand open? Yes. Yeah, so what happens there? Sometimes our clients are not as free and open with us as we would like them to be. Some people call that resistance. They say, oh, that's a resistant client. You know, we don't talk about that in MI because what is resistance? Hey, if somebody imposes something on you, what do you do? Resist. <gasps> and when you look in the mirror, darling, do you see, oh, I'm resistant. I'm a resistant human being. No, you don't. You say, well, when people push stuff on me, I resist. So it's not a characterial trait. And we're making a huge error when we say, oh, that's a resistant person. Because they're not. They're resisting something because you're pushing on them. Ah. So what happens if we take the pressure off? Well, we're going to have more hands that open, right, if we take the pressure off. Because all the rest of you went right at it, right? Let's, I'm going to get this open, or, you know, I'm going to tickle them, or I'm going to bite them open, you know. I'm going to do that. But some people will respond well to that, and some people won't, right? So hang out with these people, if you will, or if you need to go back to your seat, go ahead. But we're going to do some more exercises, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about partnership first. So in partnership, rather than telling the client what to do, and please excuse me, I use the word client, it's sort of a generic um, because I work with workers, I work with uh, people who are, uh, they have all kinds of words, users, beneficiaries, we have all kinds of words. I like client a lot. 
Yeah, I don't like a lot of those words. Um, and sometimes patience. So uh, use whatever word you want, but that is the stand-in for the person with whom you're having this conversation, okay? And worker, therapist, uh, that's the other person who's having the conversation. So rather than telling the client what to do, which is usually our go-to procedure, ask them what they want to do, not what they can do. So I don't know, uh, show of hands, anybody try to eat better in this room? Eat better, to eat more healthily. Oh, eat butter too, yeah. So you have all tried to eat better, or most of you have, and uh, if I asked you, what could you do to eat better? There's a huge amount of things that you could do. Among those, there's a very, 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 very small subset of what you would want to do or be willing to do. So the question I ask is what would you be willing to do or what would you want to do? So when I'm talking about find out what they want to do, not what they can do, but what they want to do, think about the words that you use when you ask that first question. So explore other possibilities. So if the client says, well, I don't know, invite them. Well, no, you can invite them to come up with a solution, but if they don't have one, then you say, would you like to know what has worked for other people that I, you know, that I have worked with? They almost always say yes. And then you ask them to choose. And then you get that buy-in, right? They're choosing something of their own volition. And that's important in the follow-through. Because if you give them something, they may, out of politesse, say, oh, sure, I'll do that. They come back the next week or the next month and nothing is done. This is your cue to try something else because it's not going to get better if you just repeat it and send them away again. They're not likely to change that. Inquire about the client's own solutions first, always and then explore a menu of options. Then they choose, then you're in. So evocation, this is going back to that idea that perspective is important and that if we choose to look at our clients or our patients as resources, we are gonna come out with more stuff than if we look at them as a problem to solve. So <clears throat> in this case, we have the same scenario with different perspectives and in every interaction we have with our clients. We have the same scenario with different perspectives. If you take your own perspective and can't see theirs, you are not going to reach empathy, that's for sure, and they're not necessarily going to give in to your persuasion. But if you try to take their point of view and work from there, you may have a better outcome. So this is a little roomy quote that I love, where there is ruin, there is hope for treasure which means if everything is in disorder, we can start with nothing and grow something new. And it, it gives us permission to try something different if what, is, what we've been using doesn't work. All right, so in, Montre uh, in Montreal, where did that come from? I'm homesick, no I'm not. Okay, so the therapist has a role. The therapist is in charge of the intervention, the process. And the client is fully in charge of the outcome. So no matter how good you are at this, there are people who are not going to go in the direction you want them to go. So let that off your shoulders and take on something that's possible. Because this is the Sisyphusian task, right? To make somebody do something. Now when children are babies, you can usually make them do some stuff. The bigger they get, the harder it is. And the people you're working with are mostly adults, so it's over. And they're not your adults, right? They're just adult adults. So why don't you try something different by just really putting all of your energy and focus on the process and hoping they come along? So it's like a garden. And I just, I just uh, use this analogy. You can take a handful of seeds, and the exception is dandelion seeds, but you take a handful of seeds and throw them on the ground, and some of them will, you know, some of them will grow, some of them won't. But if you take the time to dig that ground up and, and, and make it, uh, uh, if, put some food in it and water it, and then you throw the seeds down, and you put a little bit more water on top, you're going to get a better harvest. Now, still, you can't make every seed pop. Some don't grow for two years or three years, and then they grow. So you have no control over that. But if you don't prepare, and that's what this process, this intervention is about, you're preparing the ground for change. You're going to throw the seeds in there. Some of them are seeds of doubt. And sometimes those take over and they move the person forward. Sometimes it's seeds of information. Those grow and that takes over and moves people forward. And sometimes nothing happens. Maybe nothing happens for years. I don't know if anybody's ever come back to you and said, you know, remember when you said such and such a thing to me like 15 years ago? 
that totally changed my life. And you're like, I don't even remember that. Because for you, it wasn't signal. For you, it was just noise. But for them, it was like that bell ringing. So we don't really know what happens and when it's going to happen. So we're going to let that come up and let that grow as it will. But we're going to make sure that we've prepared that garden the best we can so that they have the best chance of making that grow. So again, the worker is responsible only for the intervention and the client has full responsibility for the results. That way that task is taken off your shoulders, put onto your shoulders is the task for maintaining the intervention, but that's something that is actually doable as opposed to something that's impossible. So I really want to talk about giving information the EPE way, which is the, the way we use in motivational interviewing. In your handouts, you have this written out. So it may be helpful to you now or later to have a, a little refresher. But the whole point of this is, there's, you can only see four of them, because this is not the corrected slide. Um, <clears throat> sorry. There are five steps. So E, P, E are the three big steps, and they're two little steps. One of them is ask permission, but right before that, there's affirmation. So let's take them one at a time. What do we mean by elicit or evoke? So it, this is either evoke, provide, evoke, or elicit, provide, elicit. It doesn't really matter. They're both the same thing. So we're going to go in, and you saw me do it. That was the first thing I did with Margie. I said, what do you already know? What do you already know about vaccination or vaccines. This implies several things, right? If I say, what do you know? That's not a bad question. What do you already know? Brings them in as a valued player in this conversation. And that's the first thing that we're doing to get them involved in the conversation. What we usually do is we just dump a bunch of information on people without preparing them. This is the preparation for that garden. And this is where we're going to go with this. So we prepare it this way. What do you already know? Hmm. Then we're going to affirm their knowledge, if they have any. And I did that with her. I said, wow, you already have done some work on this. That's really helpful. Or maybe she says, I don't know anything about it. Well, we can't do an affirmation on nothing. That sounds really <laughs> dumb. Oh, really, you know nothing. That's fantastic. Yeah, no, not so good. So what we're going to do is we're going to hold back on that step for a moment. And we're going to say, would it be OK with you if I give you some more information? And what I like to say is, would it be OK if I give you the freshest, most up-to-date information that I have? And I'll tell you why I say that. I'm a trained neuropsychologist. And when I was starting my training, everyone knew. And it wasn't a guess, and it wasn't a belief. It was a no, we know this. Neurons do not regenerate, period, full stop. And somewhere in the course of my studies, I was in a huge meeting. We were, I don't know, hundreds of people. Somebody throws up a slide. Remember those are the square things that go in a little carousel? Throw up a slide that shows without a doubt that neurons regenerate. There was this huge flushing sound of all of everybody's previous data right down the tubes, all their research, goodbye, kiss it all goodbye, and just an audible gasp. But the day before, neurons did not regenerate. So I say, so I don't have to eat quite so much crow, because it's not very tasty. Um, I say, can I give you the freshest, most up-to-date information that I have, knowing that information changes? And they say yes. And then I say, if they haven't had any knowledge before, this is the moment where I bring that affirmation in, and I say, hey, thanks for your openness of spirit, wanting to know more, your curiosity, your willingness to learn more. That piece is important. So now I'm having a, a, an old lady uh, blank here. Did I talk about uh, Brendan Nyan? Yeah. yeah. So this is that breakdown. I said I was going to show you this breakdown. So that piece, that affirmation, I thought was the self-determination piece, and that's what made this, this process work. In retrospect, that's part of it, but it's also the autonomy piece. So I'm asking them, and that autonomy piece also builds that relationship. So asking them from the beginning as an assumption that they already have information on the subject starts to build that relationship right away. I don't know if any of you are trained in the helping field. Some of you are researchers and other things. But in the, re in the helping field, 
we know that up to 75% of the efficacy of any psychological intervention is due to that therapeutic alliance. And here's the part that just chokes me. It's not taught how to do that. It is just not taught. There are some places that teach something about it. But overall, it's like, well, you know, we don't teach that. We know it's lacking. This is what somebody told me in my alma mater at UCAM, Université de Québec à Montréal. They said, well, yeah, we know it's lacking, but, and, and that we put 80% of our attention on theory, and we know that in the real world it's 80% practice and 20% theory. And I'm thinking, are you not mortified to tell me this? Oh, really? You're not even blushing. I can't believe that. But this is true. So they don't teach this. And that's one of the reasons I love motivational interviewing, because we'll see in a moment that that engagement of the other person is critical. And that's what Brandon Nyan was talking about. He's talking about the personal relationship that you create with your client. And I have had conversations with long-standing psychotherapists who say, oh, but you know, it takes years to create a psychological, you know, relationship, a therapeutic alliance. Um, this is, what's the vernacular that's polite? Hogwash. <laughs> yeah, no, not true. I can do it on the phone. Yeah. And I do do it on the phone. That's what gets them into my office. So I ask them right away, what are you, what, what are you looking for? What, what can, how can I help you? I open it up right away. It is the smallest investment with the biggest payoff that I know. So there you go. So we're moving forward with that. Then we ask permission. So we say, would it be OK if I give you some more information or you know, if I share with you the most up-to-date information I have? And as I said, I rarely get a no. And what this does is it shares the power. They could say no. And if they say no, I'm not going to go further with this. But most of the time, 98%, 99% of the time, they say yes. So then I go forward. But what that does is it has a physiological effect on their brains, and it opens their ears. It's, again, this preparation for seeding the garden. So their ears are open, and then you're going to give them some information. And you give it to them. And you give it to them in small enough bites so that you know they're still with you. So you pay a lot of attention to the nonverbal stuff. You may ask a couple of follow-up questions like, is that OK? Is that too much? You need some, you know, can I give you some more? Just slow it down, break it up, let them take it in. And then, so we provide that wonderful information. And then we ask one more question. And that question is about what impact this new information has on their plan, whatever the plan is, if it has one. And I always ask that last little bit. That's not in the book. That's a my thing. And it's because that offers them the option to say, no, then make any change at all. I'm not really trying to push for them to only be able to say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because what I've noticed is if I don't say that, they polarize, no, it doesn't change. It doesn't change anything for me because they don't have any other space. But if I say, wide open here, does it make a difference or not? They're like, oh, yeah, it does actually. I'm thinking in a slightly different way or, or I've decided differently. So it's an invitation, again, to choose something different. You have this on that handout just by the way. So one of those pages is this. And that's how we do it. So do one, wait, no. See one. Learn, le yeah, see one, do one, teach one. Here's your do one. Um, is it? Is it coming up? Yeah. So why don't patients just do what we tell them? because they're not involved in their process, for one thing, because we're not checking in with them, for another thing, because they have differences of values and opinions and beliefs than we do. So there's lots of good reasons why they don't do it. It's not because they're resistant. They don't wake up in the morning and say, yo, resistant Rach, how's it going? They wake up in the morning and say, I'm just me, OK? Uh, I have these beliefs, and I'm not going to do things against my beliefs. Ask Donald Trump. He keeps trying to get money from me. It ain't working. All the emails, it's not working. I just get another, I just send out another unsubscribe to them. That isn't working either. I'm going to have to do something different. Anyhow, so here we go. So with your pair, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I want you to, ah, damn it. I want you to choose a subject about which you know quite a bit. Okay, 
your partner will have another subject, pretty sure. So here's what you're gonna do. You are going to tell your partner what that partner has pretended to come in with and consult about. It can be anything. Truly and honestly, it could be yoga, it could be macrame, it could be anything you want. And there are cards involved in a different thing. I'm sorry, I didn't update this. But um, So you're going to tell your, your partner you've come to consult and learn about X, something you are comfortable with, okay? So if, say it's yoga. So you say you've come in to learn about yoga, and they say, cool. So you, the therapist, who is not the person who was the therapist before, was that? No, we didn't do that. We didn't do that. So you who has the, you who has the longest little finger will now be the, the client. You're going to be learning first about what this is. And you, the therapist, are going to follow the steps on your piece of paper. This is not an improv. Which one? Uh, the one that says EPE. Yeah. If, you're not, if you don't have one, I have some extras, and there's some extras up front. So you're going to do that, and you're going you're gonna to behave as if you, the client, will behave as if you've come to learn more about whatever the subject is. You do know, now know what the subject is. And then the therapist is going to ask what they already know about this subject, offer an affirmation if they know something, and, well, and, and the client is going to answer naturally. Okay, we'll get to that. But you're going to offer an affirmation if they know something, and if they don't, you're going to hold back a little bit and then ask if they would like to get some more information about it. They're going to say yes. Then you're going to offer the affirmation, and you're going to provide the information, and then you're going to ask for their feedback on how that changes the person's mindset about this particular thing. This is very straightforward. You're going to follow the steps. And you, as the client, will act as if you've come to find out more about whatever the subject is. You're going to re reply naturally to the question. You're going to reduce your knowledge. If you know everything there is to know about yoga, you're going to leave it for your, your therapist to tell you the most part of it. You'll give a little bit, please. This is a four-minute exercise. You're not going to go into exhaustion about this. It's not the point. The point is to run the five steps. And then you're going to reply in the positive when asked for your permission. And you're going to reply naturally to the final question, because you're going to let all that stuff land on you and see how you feel about it. It may change things, it may not. It's OK. It doesn't matter. This is really for the therapist to run those five steps. Is that clear? All right. So we're going to have uh, four delicious minutes to do this. So is there anybody without a partner who's looking for a partner? I see Nina over here standing around looking beautiful. Somebody want to somebody wanna partner up? Yeah. There's a question, excuse me. Yeah. One-sided for four minutes. One-sided for four minutes. Then you're going to switch roles and get a chance to do it on the other side. Is that okay? So if you're a third person, you can just observe also. You'll learn a lot. Hold on a sec. Is everybody ready? Okay. So four delicious minutes. After three delicious minutes, I'm very likely to tell you there's, you got a minute left, go to that last question and just move to it, okay? Make sense? All right, let her rip.
If you haven't asked that last question, now's a good time to move to it. All right, change partners, I mean, sorry, change roles, don't change partners, change roles. Change roles, other person, tell your person what you're talking about, what they've come to consult about, just take a sec. And then you've got four delicious minutes to run this exercise in the reverse sort of, or in the switch, and away you go. If you haven't gotten to that last question, now's a good time to get to it.
So, you've just run this simple five-step way that we use when we're giving information. What did you notice, particularly when you were the client and you were coming to find out more information about whatever your therapist was wanting to talk to you about, which is a little bit opposite, but hey. So what did you notice receiving that information using these steps? Yeah. Okay. And, and so she asked me to explore my, she, she sort of, in asking what I knew and exploring the motivations of why I might want to, I was able to tap into some reasons why I might want to eat meat that I would not perhaps have otherwise considered. Right. Okay. I never thought about wanting to eat it, right? Right. So, right. Yeah. So it was an opportunity that was kind of open for you. There was a lot of space there for you. Okay. Great. What about somebody else? How did that land on you when you were getting information using these five steps? Right, right. So what did you notice about not being passive, about being actively involved? What did that feel like for you? It's, you're more receptive. You were more receptive. You felt more receptive. Yeah. Okay, cool. How about somebody else? Yeah. It's sort of interesting seeing how what you say gets sort of summarized and, and put back to you. Like uh, I said, we were talking about horse riding. And I was <laughs> describing um, what I, you know, I was like, horses could bite you. And then it was sort of reflected back to me. <laughs> I'm a bit afraid of horses, and I don't think that I had sort of put that into. Well, and maybe you wouldn't want to trigger someone as being, you know, having. A you might. Like, no, no, you but might. Maybe I am afraid sure. of horses, and I didn't sure. know it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's true. And what that would have been. That's a, fantastic, that's a fantastic example because that would, would have been, if she said to you when you said, well, horses might bite you, bite you and she, said, she says to you, you're a little afraid of horses. That's a complex reflection because you didn't say that, right? But that's what was underneath that. You're afraid they're going to bite you. And she nailed it. That's exactly what that is. It's a complex reflection. Bravo. So what else did you notice? What else did you notice? Yeah. I feel the compassion of my therapist. The, the compassion of my therapist. The compassion therapist. of your therapist. <laughs> yeah, you felt yes. like she was right there with you. Yes. She was very, she was smiling. She was very kind. And she, I, I, I thought that she really wants to, to listen to me. Right. Okay. So the other thing about, about therapy that we know is that the most important thing is to feel heard and understood. To feel heard and understood is a huge part of the success of any kind of interaction, therapy or otherwise. So when you are with your friends, you love them because they get you, because they hear you and understand you and accept you. There's that third part that we don't usually mention. So they accept you just the way you are, but they're really trying to understand you and hear you when you say something. And if we do that with our patients, if we try to hear them and understand them, that's already huge. And that works on that weaving of the therapeutic alliance. So you felt comfortable sharing something with her because she was offering you that space. And it was a safe, warm environment. Cool. Somebody else? Yeah. So I noticed that um, the, that kind of last step, the, you know, the, that um, evoke step, what, if any, effect did the new information have on your thinking about your situation or in your thinking about this topic, um, actually found that um, that question became implied in that offering of the information. So. Um, it was almost, you know, it became instead of a question, it's more of a summary. Oh, it sounds like you, um, you know, have uh, that information has made you think a little bit differently. Would you like to tell me a bit more about that? We actually don't do that. Okay. There's a reason for not doing that because that really does direct somebody into something yeah. and you could be really wrong and yeah. it can terribly rebound on you. Yeah. So that question is intended for one purpose only. Do you know, I read this somewhere, it takes 10 seconds to integrate a new piece of, piece of information. Ready? You uncomfortable yet? <laughs> How many of you leave 10 seconds? Go ahead, raise your hands. Yeah, I thought so. So instead of doing that, what we do is we open the question 
And that is a comfortable place for you and your client to sit with those 10 seconds while they mijote, as we say, while they work through what you've just given them with a purpose. Because they may work through it after they leave or they may be thinking, I gotta pick the kid up at daycare. I think, eh, I think we're going with carrots tonight. Uh, you know, whatever. And it just, it's out of their mind. But we're gonna give them that 10 seconds of reflection by asking that question and not doing a reflection. Now, if we're super mandated for something, we might go with the reflection, but that's not the intention of this. So um, then how would you, so if the question, if the, the response to providing the missing information is, um, oh, I can see how that would be, you know. Then I you don't have to ask, yeah, then right. you don't so, have to answer, so this, ask the question. Right. right. Then you reflect it back. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Like, oh, okay. So, I didn't understand so, the situation. Yeah, Thank you for the clarity. situation was, you, you know, oh, oh, I hadn't really thought about it from that perspective. Right. I can see how that might be difficult. Right. Well, right. you know, maybe it's right. okay. Perfect. Right. That's true, but that doesn't usually happen. Right. So usually it requires that question. If if the person is already moving forward with you, you of course go with that. It makes perfect sense. You can see that it's real evident when it happens. Yes, Ev. Eva. Eva. Ev. Eva. We oui. close. From all my anthropological non seeing vaccinist and patient in real clinical setting, I've been uh, given talks on how to respond to vaccinist and patient and how I understand this process is as well as the last phase being uh, asking patients or clients what they understood from the information. That's a different question. That is a question that me as a person will kill you for because I don't like to be taken to task. I don't like to have a test at the end of something. So what I, what you, oh, sorry. Ev, could you repeat the, the question? I, I, I was thinking of this last stage on um, trying to see what the, peop, the person has taken from the information. For instance, we used to say that MMR has a risk of one out of a million. For me, it's really rare. But I've seen a mother for her, it was like really common. So instead of alleviating the fear, the information increased the fear. So the idea was just to reflect on the perceptions of the person, but it seems that it's not correct. Well, what, what, actually, I will make this much more clear for you what our stance is. Our stance is we don't ask you what did you understand from this. We ask that question because it's not a, not a test question. It's a process question. Now, if the person has then, if the person has seen this uptick in her anxiety about, about that because of the numbers, she's going to say that. She's going to say, whoa, when you told me that, man, that is just too much of a chance that I don't want to take with my kid. Then you may be able to recuperate that or not. That's another story and another different thing. But what I really want you to not do is say, so what did you understand about that? What did you get out of that? What, do you re what did you retain? This is another one. What did you retain about what I just told you? Oh my God, I'm sorry. If you ask me that, I'm so out of your office so fast, you're going to be seeing the back side of my skirt flapping. So we don't want that. We want to let them sit with that in a comfortable place to just turn it over, turn over that information. Yeah. So how would you ask that in the vaccine conversation and get to the very end of all their concerns? Are you then saying, um, so how, would you like to reconsider your decision? What do you, how do you put No, that? exactly what I asked you, which you answered. I said, so we just gave you all that information. How does that figure in your, in, your, in your thoughts about going forward with vaccination or not? So you are asking them, I, are you, you know, how does that affect your decision to vaccinate? Yes, absolutely. But I'm leaving it as a possibility it doesn't affect it at all. I'm not saying, what is your decision? I'm not saying, does that make you want to do it? I'm very, very careful about leaving that question as wide open as I can. OK, so that's my approach. Yes. Um, something that came for me was that the person <laughs> offering me therapy was... Um, about horses. No. About, no, no. Oh, I, I'll I, flip. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was being offered therapy about cooking. Okay, good. Um, she, what, what really came across well was that she wanted to help. She didn't want to make me right. do anything. Right. But she wanted to help me. Right. This that interest... very powerful. Right. This interest in helping me make a good decision by giving me all the information that's possible. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. 
Uh, one more, and then I'm going to switch and ask you to talk about what it was like to be the therapist. But go ahead, yeah. When you have had your discussion, uh, at the end of the discussion, how do you uh, conclude the conversation? Is there? A- I conclude it with that question first, and if they say, "Well, you know, I'm actually starting to think that I would maybe be interested in learning more about vaccinating," and then I'm going to say, "Okay, let's explore that together, and what that would mean to you." Or if they say, well, I'm not sure, then I'll invite them to think about it. Or I might say, what would it take for you to think a little harder in the direction of vaccinating? What would you need to know that might make you change your mind? This is a really good question, by the way, because some people will actually give you what you need to give them, and then you can just deliver it. Now, it may not be true that that's going to make the difference. But when you implicate them in that part of the decision making, then you give them what they've asked for, they're in a little bit of a bind, aren't they? Well, I said if I had that, I might reconsider. So it gives you a little bit of information that you need and a little bit of power for going forward. Again, no guarantees. You're just taking care of the process. So that's one of the ways. Now, if they say, well, no, it doesn't make any difference. Okay. So if it ever makes any difference to you, if you decide that you might want to do a different thing, I'd invite you to come back and talk to me anytime. And you're just leaving the door wide open. Because if you make it feel like, well, okay, well, you know, if, uh, if you ever change your mind, yeah, come back and talk to me, they ain't coming, right? And it's not an invitation. Those are the words, but that's not the attitude. So the attitude is really, okay, I've given you everything I can give you, and if that's not changing your mind, I'm sorry, you're an adult, you're okay. So you can then have that openness. Yeah. Yes, because if you want to transform the attitude mm-hmm. to a new behavior, you have to, to <coughs> take an action or to, you know. I, I, what I mean is that... Uh, Est-ce que c'est plus fa- you, facile en français, je tra- tra- traduirai. Oui. <laughs> Comment faire le passage à l'acte, en fait? Okay, ça c'est pas... Votre job. So how do we get people to actually do it then? <laughs> well, you either bring out the taser and the, uh, and the uh, hypodermic at the same time, or you say, look, come back to me if there's any other questions that I can answer for you, if there's any information that you need, or if you change your mind, come back. You can't really go further than that with these folks, except to explore a little bit in the future. So what would it take for you to change your mind? See, this is a very good question. What would it take for you to change your mind, really? They would have to say, well, Gwyneth Paltrow has to write in her stupid blog that it's a cool thing to do to to vaccinate, because I'm not doing it until she says so. It could be that, or not. But once you've hit that end there, you've done everything you can, unless you can think of something else, they are not going to go there. If they are already there, if they're saying, wow, yeah, actually, now that makes a lot more sense to me. Yeah, I think I'll do that. My dentist did that with flossing. I didn't really have ever thought about it. I never flossed in my life. I was an adult. I was 40-something. And she said a few things, and I went, that made the difference for me. And you know, I haven't skipped a day since then of flossing. It was one of those things, like turning vegetarian. The day you decided to do it, boom, she did it. There are one-offs like that, but the majority of things that we change are not like that. And they take time. So that does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. So just a very quick question. Um, how do you feel about, how do you feel? So how do you feel about that information? I don't like that question. Okay, so, like, so I'm asking. Yeah, yeah I don't like do that question because you if feel? you don't have an idea yeah. about how they feel, well, first of all, you don't care how they feel. Yeah. What you care about is what is the impact. So ask the right question. Yeah. If they say, wow, I feel really constrained about it, that doesn't give you the information you want. Yeah. Right? So ask the right question right off the bat. So how, yeah. what impact, if any, does that have on your thinking about this situation? Yeah. The, I, if, the, this is a whole rant for me, which I am not going to do right now, but the, <laughs> the, the how do you feel question just evokes an incredible rant. It's really very beautiful, but it's not appropriate here. Oh, can I have it later? <laughs> later. Okay, thanks. No problem. <laughs> All right. So as a, a practitioner, how do you feel about possibly changing your practice now that you've had this activity? Does that seem like it would fit into your practice somewhere? Absolutely. Yeah. OK. Just <laughs> how do you feel about putting this in practice? You're right. Because I want to know how they feel about the action, not how they feel about the information. 
but how do you feel about putting it into your practice? Is it possible? Right, absolutely. So what do you think? Is there a place for it in your practice? We oui, know a peu, uh, yeah? Hey, yes! <laughs> Absolutely, with your adolescence. So what do you know about uh, smoking weed? Okay, I don't know anything. I never inhaled. So uh, what else? What else did you get out of this? You want to? Pardon? Even with permission, it would be awkward when you say, let me share something about mine too. Yeah, right. That's a personal choice. All right, so what I want to just do is draw your attention to the microcosm of MI that this is. So in MI, we do find out... Excuse me, that's not what I meant to do. We do find out what the person wants to know right away. We want to bring them into the conversation and keep them there. This is part of engaging. We want to keep them active. I don't know, anybody who works with people, do you prefer somebody who's active and cranky or passive? No, oh, active and cranky every time. Right? Because they're in motion. And you know what? It's physics. It's just plain old physics. A body in motion is easier to keep in motion. A body at rest is really hard to move into motion, all right? So even if they're cranky, they're moving. So let's take that energy and move it forward in a direction. So that's the first part of this in involvement. We're going to get them involved right in the first thing, and we're passing the message that you have value in this, in this conversation. You're not just a lump that's arrived in my office. The next thing we do is we affirm their knowledge. What does that do for them? What does that do? What does affirming somebody's strength do for someone? What does it do? It makes them feel good. It makes them feel good, but it's very specific. What does it do? Respected. Respected. That's possible. What else? Brings them in as a partner. Brings them in as a partner. What does that give them? Value. Power. Power, value, confidence. All of those things you need to make a change, right? Because it takes courage to make a change, is it not? So we've got that going on in the second step or sometimes the third step if they don't know anything. Okay, then we ask permission, what does that do? What's respect? respect? What, in what sense? Well, it makes them feel like, you know, respected that they've got these concerns and, and you know, you're asking if you, if you can give them additional information. It's just sort of, yeah, I think it's respectful. It's respectful and it's ceding power. They then have a chance to say no. Whenever do you have a chance to say no when people are dumping information on you? Practically never. But this is your chance to say, no, I really don't want to know anymore about that. And that's one of the times it happened to me. Somebody didn't want to know about autism. They came for a, an evaluation, because I was a neuropsychologist, and they didn't want to know anything about autism. Thank you very much. Total shutdown. It's OK. So then we give them information. What does that do? Why do we do that? What does that do? It's empowering. Information is power, right? Knowledge is power. So then they have all the information, their own and ours, put together in an organized fashion. And then this final question, what does that do? Finds out about the impact of the new information on the combination with the old information and where that's getting them. And it gives them the opportunity to, in front of your eyes to process that new information. So these steps all fit into the whole MI thing. We've got acceptance, because if you say no to me, that's fine. I'm going to accept that. That's where you are right now, and I'm not going to push you any further. All right? We've got compassion. I'm trying to understand your point of view. That's why I asked you that first question. We've got partnership. We're both in this conversation together as equal partners. You've got your expertise. I've got mine. We're in here together. Evocation, I'm asking you to give me what you've got. And then I'm asking you again to process what we've just put out on the plate. So that's why I love this thing. It's really a microcosm of the spirit of MI. And it's wicked effective. And it took you four minutes. Now, if you have a lot of information, maybe six. Really? Because people can't take that much more information in. So you got to shorten that up. And this works amazingly well. It's like a party trick. It's like magic. It's ridiculous that it's so easy. And yet, people don't do it. And we usually forget the last question. One way or another, we forget the last question. Try not to forget the last question. It's really important for people to integrate the information you've given them and give them a chance to think it through. Margie. Sorry, Rachel, I was just going to say that with the vaccine conversation, though, depending on the degree of hesitancy of the parent, it's actually a really, really complicated conversation unless you just limit them to one or two 
two or even three of the top concerns and then say, look, we'll have to continue this another time? Because I spend up to 60 minutes with um, a highly vaccine-hesitant family and usually by the end of the consultation I can get them to accept all or some vaccines. Cool. But it's an hour. It may be faster this way. You could try. And the other thing is we did do two rounds of it with you. I don't know if you noticed. Yeah, yeah you did. Yeah. Yeah, because I introduced a whole new set of information. That's right. To homeopathy, and I was sort of aware of doing that. That's right. Whereas you could have st- if I hadn't done that, it could have been much shorter. Sure. So I, I think this will shorten it a little bit. Mm-hmm. And, um, but I, I do think that we can't oversimplify it with the highly vaccine-hesitant families. I think that's where the, the Sam and I were talking about this the other day. There's an opportunity for a referral to... Um, a service, um, an immunisation specialist, Could be. where you can actually delve down further. Yes. Actually what they want is the depth of information that the average provider can't provide. Right. So, so you are in a particular case and that is perfect. So what you would do after this is they, you feel that they've got a little yeah. bit of give. You say, would you be interested in getting referred to somebody who can go into this That's with right. you more? And they're going to say yes if they have any. And in fact, the main outcome then is that, that they're open, they're receptive. Yep. That's right. That's right. But you might not, you won't get there at the end of that conversation. Everybody has constraints. MI works within the constraints. It does not work outside of the constraints. It doesn't mean if you only have 15 minutes, you've got to spend an hour. We actually had that conversation. No, you spend the time you've got, but use it well. If referral is a possibility, which it is not necessarily in everybody's work, then refer. That's fabulous. Or recall. Or recall. Yeah, you can bring them back. Yeah. So, of course, you're going to work within your constraints. It's really, really important. Does that give you a good sense of this tool? Yes. Like you might use it? Definitely. Cool. All right, great. So we already talked about that. We talked about that. All right. So, oh, let, whoopsie. Let's talk about the ORs. Again, this is Bill Miller all over the place. ORs, open questions, affirmations, reflections, and summaries. In French, it's ouvert. It's just silly. Anyway. So open-minded questions, I I like to put the minded in there because it's that sense of gentle curiosity without judgment. These are very, very important. When we have probing curiosity, it can make people very, uh, very uncomfortable. And they can feel like they're being manipulated and moved around. So my, my attitude is as best I can come up with, wow, really? So what else? Oh, really? No sarcasm. This is my biggest challenge in life. (laughs) <laughs> no sarcasm because it really backfires unless your client knows you well and is comfortable with that, in which case style is everything and it's fine. Affirmations are very specific. They are not compliments. You look marvelous is not an affirmation. But you put a lot of effort into, that, into choosing that outfit. Could be. Because I have clients who come in looking like the dog's breakfast all the time because they just don't feel good enough to get tidy. And one day they come in and you say, wow, something's changed. You've put a lot of effort into how you look today. Tell me more about that. And they're like, well, I woke up this morning and I, you know, whatever. And they tell me. But it's not you look marvelous because that's a compliment. That's different. It's not wow. It's not cheerleading. It is underlining a specific strength, value, or effort that they've made. And these are powerful because they really affect change, and we don't use them. So when I say to my uh, hesitant client, hey, you've done quite a lot of work on this. That's great. That's going to be helpful. I'm underlining a strength. When I say, I really appreciate that you're open enough to have this conversation with me. That's underlining that. I do work with people who have trauma. It's not easy to talk about a trauma you've had. And I say, you know what? Thank you. It's an honor that you're willing to share that with me. So we can give those affirmations very, very clearly and specifically, and it works that relationship. It's amazing. Because they usually can't see that in themselves and are very appreciative of having that mirror of being able to see that in themselves from your eyes. Reflections. We've been talking about them. We're going to do a little bit more with that because it's really the art form of motivational interviewing. So first, we've learned about reflect. Who has not heard about reflective listening or reflections or any of that? Who has not heard about that? Okay, so some of you have not. But in general, when we reflect back, we, it's, it's sort of like the mirror thing. It's offering a mirror of what the person has said. But for the most of you, the only reflection you learned 
was either a direct rep repetition of what they said, exactly or quite close, without adding any meaning, or a reflection of the emotion that's obvious. And those are both really good, but if those are your only tools, it, they're insufficient for this approach. So for instance, if you work with adolescents or have them, then they will look at you like, duh. Like you just so duh, or, did you just repeat what I said? You are like as dumb as a post. I'm sorry, I don't wanna to talk to you. But if you say something that's underneath that, that was implied, that you felt in your heart, it's a hypothesis that you throw out there. If they endorse it, you go with that. If they refuse it, you go with that. That's the accuracy. So if you say, wow, that really makes you mad, and they say, no, it just frustrates me. You go with frustrate. Don't stick. Move with them. And here's what they're doing. Anybody ever see those little drawings? They're like identical, except there are 10 differences in this one than from this one. You know, so it's really easy to knock off the first five, right? Those are the obvious ones. Your eyes catch that really easily. And then you're down to like six, seven, eight. Whoa, and nine and 10 are really hard. So your attention just zooms in on that to like you're looking at minutia. Now, when you give a reflection that's deeper than what the person has said, they're doing that comparison between, oh, I said that, she said that. How much overlap? Oh, wow, yeah, mm, but it's not that. That brain is super active. It's really reflecting on what they actually said and meant. Whereas if you just repeat it, they go, uh-huh, and they're off to the next thought. But this way, it deepens their own reflection by the depth of your reflection. And you can have a whole conversation with only reflections and no questions and still move the person forward. But this is a talent and a skill that you can develop. It's not a talent, actually, it's a skill. You can develop this, but it does take work. It's not obvious. So those reflections are really important, and summaries are great because they help you transfer from one thing to another. You just wrap things up in a nice bow, and you hand it back to your client. Or you pick all the beautiful flowers, none of the dead flowers, and you hand them back. So moving forward, open-minded questions. Now, what is an open-minded question, and what are we comparing it to? Closed questions. What's a closed question? Yeah, the, the, the realm of answers is very constrained. So we often think of them as yes or no questions, but it could also be Saturday, or 10.30, or yesterday, or some other small How thing. How many? Six, right. So it could be any small answer. It is a non-invitation to talk. Now, it doesn't mean that people won't elaborate. They might, because people want to talk. They come in and they want to talk. People do. That's what we're made for. That said, if you get adolescents or other people who are hesitant, that don't feel comfortable, they will take that non-invitation and not talk. And it's really easy for them to do that. So we're gonna make it a little harder for them to not talk by inviting them with an open question. So one of the first open questions that you wanna start with is how do you start your session? If you ask, how are you doing today? You're gonna to get a reflexive answer, right? This is a hugely open question. They may talk about their dog, or the parking, or you know anything that's not useful. Or they may actually jump in, but that's, so narrow that open question a little bit. So why are you here to talk to me today? What's bringing you in today? That's gonna focus it right away, and this is important, because we focus so that we can stay on track and be efficient, and they choose the focus. So they come in and I'm talking about vaccination today. Or I want to talk about my baby's uh, progress, you know, six week uh, checkup. That's fine, so let's start there, all right? That starts the focus. Now that's a really good one. The other questions we like to use are often when we're solution seeking with our client, once we really understand what's going on with them, we may ask questions like, what's worked for you in the past to overcome some kind of obstacle like this? What has helped you to get further along when you feel blocked? How do you like to learn? What is easier for you? How do you wanna do this? What, what solutions can you come up with for this issue? And those kind of questions we call evocative questions because we're evoking their own solutions. So that's when we use questions. We use closed questions in MI when they're efficient and we're looking for data points. If you ask me, 
How tall am I? I'm going to tell you precisely how tall I am. If you ask me a question like, oh, tell me about your height, I'm going to give you a whole different answer. It's going to be completely different. So ask the question for the information you need. If you want to hear how tall I am, ask me how tall I am. If you want to hear what it was like growing up as the smallest kid in class my entire life, ask me what is that about. So get the question to fit what your needs are. Sometimes we just need to know how old is your baby? Not tell me about your baby's like, growth. You might need that or tell me about your baby's age. Well, he's, you know, he's kind of partway there to a half a year. You know, okay, yeah, let's get a fish in here with our questions. So there's nothing wrong with closed questions, but we use them too much. And they are very effortful if we're trying to get a lot of information because we're fishing with one single line instead of a net. So sometimes we want that net and we want all the fish and including the boot and the other weird stuff that you get in there because sometimes that can be helpful. But sometimes it's too much and you just really want to know how old's that baby anyway? So that's what we do. Questions to which you don't yet know the answer. Don't ask questions you know the answer to. How do you feel about that? If you have any sense at all as a therapist, you have a pretty good idea. So make it a reflection. You feel really stuck there. Instead of how do you feel about that? There's a whole lot of reasons why people ask that how do you feel question and I don't really agree with most of them. When in fact I can name that, the person can name it back to me or adjust it. It's not like I'm giving them a free ride. So then we move on and we have a sense, they have a sense that I'm really understanding what they're saying because I've just offered how they feel without asking because I've been paying attention. And if I'm wrong, they correct me right away. Adolescents in particular love to correct anybody who will listen. It gives them power. And if I realign, I've got a great relationship going right there. So that's one of the reasons we use that. So here's a difference. This is just an example of the, between uh, an open and a closed question. If the person says, I need to get more exercise, we could ask a closed question, have you tried X? So let's say, I need to get more exercise. Have you tried running? What is the problem with that? I hate running. Well, you might hate running. And you might also think that I must like running, and now, oh, I'm stuck between hating something she likes, I need to please her because I'm getting service from her. It gets real complicated, right? It shows my bias. I don't need to show my bias. I want to find out what you've already done. So I'm going to ask that question, what have you already tried? And then I'm going to say, so what happened with that? What was the most successful thing you tried and what was good about it? I'm going to stay on the useful side rather than, oh, so what failed for you? But that's where we go, right? We go right for the problem. What failed? So what was no good about that? Come on. What was good about the things that worked and how do we make them better? Do you need more exercise to lose weight? Nice close question. How does that work for you? There's a lot of reasons to get more exercise, aren't there? Losing weight may be one of them. Are you saying I'm fat? Exactly. <laughs> That's the implication. So we don't want to go there. So we're going to say, tell me more about needing more exercise. And you're going to get a wonderful answer from somebody who's actually given it some thought. And it may be, I'd like to lose some weight. But they're saying it, not you. So we can offer our presence. This is a whole thing in itself. It's a stance. It's an attention that we bring to the other person. And we're going to practice it. So with your partner, this is a tricky one. So the person who has the curliest hair is the person who's the client. Figure it out. And if you don't have a partner and you want one, please raise your hand. Oh, we've got a we've got a lonely a lonely individual here. Is there anybody who will pair up? I can observe, I can spot you may. Or I can observe. Well, somebody can observe. It doesn't matter. So find find a partnership. So here's the thing: the speaker or the client will talk about what compassion means to you in your life, either your professional life, your personal life, anything you want to say. All right, that's not too complicated. And. Um, Ignore the cards thing. Um, if you run out of things to say, just stay quiet. Because sometimes what happens is we run out of things to say, and something else comes up in that silence. 
Sometimes we run out of things to say and we've run out of things to say. That's okay. This is not a 15 minute exercise. I'll give you the heads up for that. <clears throat> it's a three delicious minute exercise. Now the listener is actually gonna be listening with their eyes closed. It says soft eyes, but actually they're softly closed. <laughs> and all your heart, all your attention, listen with your knees, listen with everything you've got and receive all you have to do is receive what that person is telling you. No fixing, no talking, just receive. Is that clear? So you have three delicious minutes to do this, and at the end, I'm gonna ask you, the listener, to do a summary. It's gonna be a 20 second summary of three minutes. So you really need to do that synthesis and find out what's going on with that person about compassion and dish it up in 20 seconds. So think about how you're receiving that with your eyes closed and that you're gonna give it back. So here we go, is everybody clear on this? So one person is gonna be talking, the other person is gonna be listening, and we'll do a 20 second summary at the end of that. We are not switching roles. This is just one three minute segment. Ready, go. Listeners, listeners, you've got 20 seconds to do a tight synthesis of the important things that your person just told you. 20 seconds, go ahead.
How'd you do with that? So clients, when you were talking, speakers, what was it like to talk to somebody who gave you their full attention but no verbal feedback? How was that for you when somebody was giving you all of their attention and listening? How'd that feel? Right, right. So it's a little vulnerable for you. Yeah. Uh-huh. How about somebody else? What was it like? Yeah. Uh, it was funny for me because usually I am the listener and not the speaker. And so I was a bit surprised. Surprising for you. Okay. So inhabitual to be in a different position. And a little uncomfortable, it sounds. Perhaps. Mm-hmm. And so I thought about my relationship with Ed, whom I really like but don't know that well. But I felt safe to do that with her. But I don't know how much of that is underscored by the fact that I already know and like her. And if I just met her at the beginning of the session, whether I would have felt so comfortable. Right. So there's a whole lot of things at play here in how we share things with people. I have just a quick question. When was the last time you had three minutes of uninterrupted space (laughs) in which to speak? can't remember, can you? It was a while back. Right. So it's interesting that we talk very, very often about listening, right? So how did it feel to listen and not inter- intervene? What was that like for you when you were the listener? So you use the visual cues a lot when you listen, right? Yeah, I felt the same. Felt the same, that you were missing information because you didn't have the visual cues, right? Yeah. I felt the need to express with the rest of my face that I was paying attention. Right. He did, he, he did yeah. I could sense when something resonated because he would sort of yeah. smile and I was like, can you listen? Right. <laughs> Right, so you had the understanding between the two of you, despite the fact he wasn't actually verbalizing it, that he was present for you and listening. Yeah. Right. And I didn't like the eyes shut. No, it made you uncomfortable that his eyes were closed. Mm-hmm. Right. Right, so we feel uncomfortable if we're not able to be sure that we're nodding like crazy and saying, yeah, hmm, yeah, ha, hmm, hmm, because we think that maybe they don't think we're listening, that maybe they're not getting it, that we're really paying attention, because that's part of our culture, right? But we talk about listening, listening, listening as if it's the be all and end all. And clearly, it's impossible to have a conversation if there's no back and forth. If it's one way, it's a wonderful place to drop something in a trusting, in a non-judgmental place, but it doesn't do the same thing as a conversation goes back and forth, right? So thank you for doing that. That's a, it's a bit of a challenge, that kind of a, an exercise. But I want to just put the point out there that listening is great and most people need a little bit more feedback. They need a little bit more back and forth so that they can feel connected. We can't really build that relationship if it's one-sided. It's very difficult. So let's talk about accurate reflections. I used to, by the way, just a little thing, I used to do it with the eyes open, and it was uh, confusing. I got more negative feedback about eyes open than eyes closed. So I decided I would try it with eyes closed, and people have split out in two camps. They listen better with their eyes closed, or they are disrupted by the fact that the eyes are closed. It's cool. It's really about the listening. So accurate empathic reflections, we are focusing all of our attention 
on understanding the other person. What do they mean? Not what did they just say, that's when we're just testing our audition, but we are really trying to find out what they mean by what they say, and it requires a different level of listening. And the reflection is always in the form of a statement, in that the voice goes down at the end. In, uh, in the US and sometimes in Canada, we talk about upspeak. Has anybody heard this term? Yeah? <laughs> Every sentence is a question. Well, I want to tell you that this is universal. It's not just Aussie. Because I teach in France, in French. I teach in Quebec, in French. I teach in English all over the place, and people do it all the time. My personal hypothesis about this is Valley Girls from the 80s. Anybody old enough to remember that may be able to track it back. But previous to that, I don't remember people doing it. And it's become endemic. And it's when the voice goes up at the end, in a statement, we're trying to make a statement, but it comes out like this, right? You get that? So that's up speak. And so we break out the reflections into two kinds, or simple reflections, which is what the person is saying. It's an exact repetition of the person's words, or you know, switch out one word for another, but no change of meaning. That is something that most people who are in the helping professions have learned, and they call that reflection. What we call reflection is that's a simple reflection, let's go for the deeper reflection. So a complex reflection is what does the person mean? And the easiest way that I know of, and I've only just learned this in the last few months, the easiest way is to imagine you're telling somebody to your, you know, to your left or to your right what is going on with this person. So when I go around and I coach, I say, what's going on with that person? And they never say, well, the person just said this, and then they said that, and then they said this. They don't parrot it back. They say, and they synthesize what's going on with the person. Or in the very rare case, they say, I don't know. Very rare. But that synthesis, if we shift it from the third person grammatically to the second person, then all of a sudden we have a very good complex reflection. It's easy to do if we think about it. It's a little bit of a mental gymnastic, but it's worth, it, it's worth its weight in gold. So these are some of the possibilities. You feel that. These are just suggestions. If you use these all the time, people drop dead of boredom in your office. Not really cool. So it's important to you that. Now, I've noticed about it's important to you. This is the passive voice, and it's a lot better if you can make it an active voice. And I only realized this last week, so I haven't changed all my slides, but it's coming. Amplification, that's when we blow it up bigger than it is. So there's no way ever that you will consider vaccinating your kid. There's nothing in this world that could possibly make you change your mind, even if you know that the chances of harm to your child are incredibly low. The chances of harm to your child if you don't do it are much higher than that, and we will enumerate those things. We use it a lot in substance misuse. So you don't see any problem whatsoever with the amount you're drinking, not in your personal life, not in your family life, not in your work life, not in your financial life, not in your, your health life. And we just leave it like that. No sarcasm or the whole thing blows up like North Korea. Not cool. So we go for this as cleanly as we can with this sense of gentle curiosity to make sure we haven't missed anything. Because what we're doing is we're running up against a closed door. And what we're hoping for is, well, yeah, I guess if I heard there was an endemic or an, ap an epidemic, I might consider vaccinating my kid. And we're going to put our foot in the door and try to slither our way in to have the conversation. Not to change anything necessarily, but to at least get the conversation going. So that's what we do this for. And it's very delicate. And we do it in a very specific way. Now, the other part is, is when people are all over the place, they're all over exploding. And, they, and, and so they come in and they say, look, everything is going wrong. I read all about these cases where everybody is dying from this. We don't want to dial that down. So you have some concerns right now. So we're concerned, some concerns, not some panic, right? Some concerns right now that's smaller, smaller. And you're interested in talking about some of the real life situations that you're aware of. It's gonna dial all that panic down. That's a minimization. Double-sided, it's when we do one side and the other, okay? So we might say, so on the one hand, you are not sure you wanna vaccinate your kid. 
And this is when they've said, I don't want to vaccinate. So we're going to lighten that side up a little bit. That's sustained talk. We're going to make it a little bit less intense. Say it again. On the one hand, you're not sure you want to vaccinate your kid. They usually won't back up on you on this, by the way. It's just a slight shift. And on the other hand, you really want the best for your child. Now, I didn't say but. You know why? What does but do in a sentence? Exactly, it's an eraser. It's a verbal eraser. So then there's only the last piece. And if you have forgotten to put the useful piece at the end and the less useful piece towards change at the beginning, all they're stuck with is the useful for not change piece. Er, don't do that. What you're trying to do is get up the cognitive dissonance. You're going to raise the temperature of that. So you put two things that are incoherent in front of the person, and this is one of those moments where you make them confront their own coherence without confronting them. Well, wait a minute, you said this and then you said that. That doesn't fly in, in MI. But on the one hand, you're saying this and you're saying that. Hmm. And you go into Columbo mode. Hmm. And the point of that is you need to leave them with that clanging in their heads that they have just said two things that don't seem to go together and let that work on them. The and is important. The other part that's important because of recency effect is that the thing that they hear last is the thing they remember best. So you want to help them move forward by leaving the moving forward part at the end of the sentence and the staying back part at the beginning of the sentence. So again, a little bit of gymnastics, but well worth the effort because they, they, they're left with that little bit of momentum towards change. Finally, coming alongside this is autonomy building. Look. You're the, you're the final decider. Nothing I can say is going to make you do anything, and I'm well aware of that, and I'm perfectly okay. You're able to make a decision, and I'm here to help you make whatever best decision you feel. And they're like, what? You're lifting off the pressure? Wait a minute. Then maybe I could change, because I'm not being shoved into the wall of change. I'm being like just saying, well, you know, I can do it. Huh. So this is, again, that sort of self-determination piece that's very helpful for unblocking. And finally, for Bill Miller, one of the two founders, Bill Miller and Steve Rolnick, of motivational interviewing, the metaphor is the nec plus ultra of reflection. So showing somebody a way of seeing something in a different way, something common in a different way, is extremely powerful. And it shows your empathy because you've transformed it into something completely different. And you've gotten them. You got it. It's very rare that you attempt a metaphor and it's wrong. Very, very rare. Because you won't do it if you're not really sure of yourself. So some of the famous ones are between a rock and a hard place, entre l'arbre et l'écorce in French. So they really get squeezed, you know, squeezed. Or one of our, our classics is, it's as if there's a whole pack of crows pecking on you. Because their family was all over this person, right? Get that feeling. And then you're like, oh, wow, they get me. And it's really important. Everyone wants a piece of you. Sure, yeah. sure. So any of those, and, and there's no end to metaphors. You can create them and create them. I had somebody in, in one of my French groups say, well, we don't have metaphors in France, in French. I'm like, you don't? And then I thought, wait a minute. And I generated seven right in a row. Boom, 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 boom. Because my French mind was going, and it just created them. Because of course we do. We use them all the time. We just don't notice them. So the metaphor as a possible reflection. So what's underneath ambivalence? Underneath ambivalence is a desire for power, for autonomy, for agency. So we call it sovereignty, but we don't usually call it sovereignty in Quebec. <laughs> or in Kurdistan, anyway. Um, belonging, a need to belong, a fear of not belonging, being lovable and loving. These are actually needs. Being lovable and loving and being capable. And these are based on fears. So the fears that they map onto is the fear of being abandoned, the fear of being engulfed. And when I think of engulfment, I think of being caught in quicksand, where it comes in through your mouth and your nose and your ears, and you're surrounded by it, and you cannot move and you cannot breathe. And I think about this in terms of the hovering parent the overprotective parent, the jealous partner. You looked over there, 
I saw you looking at that guy or that gal. What guy? What gal? Oh, you looked over there. Uh, and all of a sudden, it's dangerous to do anything. And so you become paralyzed. And that's this engulfment thing. Shame, inadequacy, failure, we lump them into one because they're so delicious and we really overuse them in our lives. We're afraid of all of that and loss and death. So these map back onto, whoops, go backwards, thank you. Go map onto these in a very particular way. You can see the lines. You, often I put them on one slide, but I, uh, I didn't do that today. So there are four fears. There are many more than that. I'm desperate for somebody to translate this into French. Because <laughs> I love this piece. I just think it's phenomenal. And um, this poet is also a teacher. And he's done some amazing pieces. So I encourage you to check out Taylor Malley's website and be amazed by his cool stuff. So this time in your pairing, the speaker is going to speak about his or her hopes and dreams. Okay, so now you're going to switch roles. So if you were the listener before, you're going to be the speaker. And the listener is going to give you his or her full presence, listening with full-on attention and eyes open this time. And you're going to use simple and complex reflections to get the conversation to move deeper and further forward. And you are really going to not ask any questions. So if you're the speaker and you hear that up speak or you hear a question because they're going to be pushing to get out sometimes, you're going to just raise your finger and say, question, and your speaker's going to, and your, sorry, and your, your worker's going to take that back and reformulate it into a reflection. Notice that simple reflections do not move the conversation forward very much, so you need to add something to the reflection that's significantly different from what the person said by how that hits you as you're listening with your heart. And what you hear is what is going on with the person. If you hear nothing, then you're going to send back a simple reflections because you don't know what to do and you're not allowed to ask questions. But take a risk here. 
try to hear with your heart what is happening with this other person about his or her hopes and dreams and try to send that back as a complex reflection. So you're going to have another three delicious minutes to do this. And use your little cards to help guide you if you need them to try some different kinds of reflections. You might find that they're helpful. Do you have any questions about this? All right, so three minutes and I'll ring the bell. So bring that conversation to a close, if you would. So folks, when you were the client and receiving those reflections, how did that feel to you? We just kind of got off on a tangent about my anxieties, really. OK. <laughs> All right. So you, so you started, interestingly, with your hopes and your dreams and got into anxieties. We call this the swamp. And in MI, we try to keep people out of the swamp by making reflections that are more like ladders than shovels. <laughs> Generally speaking, when people are stuck, they're like in a hole. And sometimes if we explore their stuckness, it's like giving them a shovel. 
which is not a great way to get out of a hole unless you're a really good digger. Whereas a ladder might be a little more efficient. So what we're going to try to do is give them a reflection of something more helpful that helps them climb out of the hole. Sometimes we have to explore what's not helpful or what's blocking them, but most of the time we do that out of our own curiosity, which is not a bad thing, but it's not helpful to the other person and it is actually harmful to cause somebody to ruminate. So we like to stay out of the swamp and move up and out of the hole, and ladders are the way to do it. So how about somebody else who got some reflections from their, uh, from their, from their therapist type? Yeah. Uh, I must say my therapist was very good because he really took me in an, an, another place that I, didn't, I hadn't planned to go, uh -huh. but he really helped me to, to, uh, to, 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 to find solutions. To not, I, had, I had anxieties about certain things, about my dreams, mm -hmm. and he took me another place that helped me, really. Cool. So he was really good. In three delicious minutes. In three delicious minutes. So this is another answer to the question of, well, how long does this take anyway? You know, I'm a doctor. I got 15 minutes for these people. Well, three minutes, and we already have some movement. It's kind of cool. Thank you. Somebody else, how did it feel to receive those reflections? Anybody get one that was kind of off? And you had to correct them? No? Uh, I think even if the response is a bit off, it doesn't matter as long as you feel, you feel hurt. That's right. So you, you don't really care what the response is if someone's looking at you and, and making you feel hurt. Well, that's interesting because if somebody makes a lot of mistakes, yeah, you do start to notice that and it starts to be really irritating and it doesn't take long because you realize that they're not really listening. They're pushing their own agenda. Yeah, now, if so they adjust, like right, so... Right. The response, I mean, she felt the response was slightly off, so maybe that's what I'm saying. It wasn't off because I still felt hurt. And that's the important part to retain because we can make a mistake. We can make many mistakes, actually. And it's what we do with the mistake we make. So I'm presuming that Nina redirected once you said, eh, nah, that wasn't it, either visually or, and, or verbally, right? When it's like, hmm. And then she's going to reorient a little bit. And that reorientation is that, is that um, accuracy that we're then showing. So it's a little bit like any of those games like uh, battle, Battleship or um, Mastermind, where if we way off, we get a huge whole field that we can cut out because it's not in there. And sometimes that's the most helpful because sometimes we're, we're conflicted. There's two things going on and we think it's this, or that, if we're sure, we go in one direction. But if we're not sure, we're going to just you know, throw the dice and hope we, hope we hit it. If they say, uh-uh, it's not that at all, oh, well, all right then. And we redirect. And it's very, very helpful. And they never interpret this as, you are so stupid as to have made that suggestion. Because the suggestion is not out of left field. It's just you were presented with the problem of two possibilities, and you went with one and didn't happen to be right. Now, the problem is if you stay with yours, which is your agenda showing its face, that can be a problem. But if you switch right away, they just think you're genius. They think you're really paying attention and it really brings out that feeling of being heard and understood. So don't fear making a mistake. Fear not listening well. That's the thing to be very attentive to. Yeah. That change in direction, in, in my experience from the, that, the client side, it, it actually gives me the sense that um, understanding and hearing me matters to the person I'm talking to, yeah. right? And yeah. So it doesn't. So and that matters more to me than that they got it right the exactly. first or the second or even the third time. Exactly. And you see the effort, yeah. and the effort is really the part that people interpret. The actual words, just as you said, are yeah, pretty important, but hey, it's the effort. What else did you notice? Receiving, yeah. So, so I, I found myself reacting to my uh, my sort of listening partner sort of synthesizing, going beyond just repeating and actually giving me a little bit insight. And so the, my initial reaction was, wait a minute, this is not what I was saying. But then within seconds, yes, so she, she caught on to something that I wasn't actively thinking about. Right. And it was, so, and that's, that's like half a second of discomfort followed by, wow, like, you know, that that's something that I couldn't have come up with, but someone else verbalized it, uh, you know, in, in a way which was reflective. 
Right. And that's where reflection causes reflection. So reflection in French with an X, you know, les reflets causent des réflexions. In English, we would say the reflections cause us to reflect. So it's that comparison thing. Well, she just said that, but I didn't say that. Well, wait a minute. Oh, you know what? Yeah, that was in there. I had no idea. We can be very surprised. And it's often very, very helpful and revelatory. Revelatory. That. Revelatory. Great. Anybody else? So, yeah. It does make it, it's, it's a broader comment, but I, I just re reflecting, <laughs> I can think of two or three people in my life, friends, who, who just listen. Okay, when you, when you, whenever you meet them, the first thing they say is that they ask, how are you? They listen, and they listen. And those people, you always want to be with them. You know, they could call me any time of the day or night to go, I don't know, do something stupid. I'd go because you, you just want to be with them. They have that, incre that incredible ability yeah. in a personal relationship. It's interesting. I, I just, I just realised I can think of three people who do exactly that. Yeah. I think they listen with an accepting attitude. If they just listened and they had on their face, like, are you out of your mind most of the time? You probably wouldn't call them up or go and do stuff with them. No, Occasionally. Okay. Right. I call them up too. But yeah, but different, right? They don't, they don't bring that warmth. So what was it like for you to generate those reflections? What was it like to listen for what is really going on here that I can grab and send back? What was that like for you? Those of you who were the therapist. Yeah. It was great. Hold on, one sec. One Aussie, then the next. I found it challenging in the sense that... Um, Katie, microphone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I found it challenging... I feel heard now. Um, I found it challenging in the sense that um, Ev was talking about one of those things that's a zero-sum game in a way. So... It was the work-life balance, if mm -hmm. you don't mind me revealing that. And so I was reflecting back to her and trying to do that kind of higher level analysis of what she was saying and, and see what was behind it. But in a way, I felt like we were a little bit in the swamp. And if we were not in um, this mode, I probably would have tried to be more constructive in terms of p putting a ladder in place, but that wasn't part of the task. So I... I, I felt limited in my, I felt like I could help and reflect and, and Ev seemed to respond to my reflections, but I felt that I couldn't quite be as helpful as I would have liked. Right. So there's two things I want to say about that. Often what we think of as putting a ladder in place is giving suggestions to what is coming out. Not always. Okay, I'm not making a presumption here, but that's frequently what happens. We want to suggest something that's going to be helpful. Forward moving reflections are a higher order of reflection. First, we just teach you what the heck a reflection is and what a complex reflection is. How do we add a little meat around the bone? And then we try to make that bone move with the meat, which is kind of crazy when we think about it, but that's a forward moving uh, reflection. So that's the kind of reflection I'm talking about when I'm talking about a ladder. I'm talking about a ladder because th that just moves people in increments. So if we are, again, feeling this pull to be more helpful, it's because we're looking at them like a problem. And maybe we need to just back that off for a little bit and look at them like the well and just find out more. So we can find out more with reflections. Sometimes we need a few questions. And again, in your office, in a real conversation, we're going to use those questions. But much, much more sparingly than you do now, because you now have another possibility, which is to use reflection. And in MI, we use more reflections than questions, more open questions than closed questions, more reflections than questions, more complex reflections than simple reflections. That's going to give us a full whopping amount of power behind our motivational interviewing so that we can bring people forward in this reflexive uh, no, reflective, not reflexive, reflective active mode. That is what we're really shooting for. So in this wee little exercise, you probably didn't get there and it's perfectly okay. But it is out there and when we practice, when we really learn all these muscles and build them all up, we can be very, very, very powerful when we put the whole thing together. Here's the good news. MI, learning MI is modular. You can take on one piece even one thing that you learned today 
and practice that. Become natural with that and then add another piece. Work that until it's worked in and integrated. Add another piece. Do it at your own rhythm. Practice. See if you can get some feedback from somebody about it if you really want to go forward. Because what we know is you can spend three days with me in a wonderfully energizing and engaging blah 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 but six months down the line you may still retain the EPE you may retain scales and you have the scales on the flip side of the EPE but that's about it that's what you got and you're not going to keep this reflection thing because you're not sure about it and you're going to let it go because you don't want to feel incompetent in your work and no reason not to do that right that makes sense but if you want to keep going you need feedback, and there are lots of ways to get that. You can record your sessions, send them into a, a coding team. I have one. There's a lot of other ones. I, I have a team that codes in both languages, English and French. But we've got coding teams in Spanish. We've got coding teams in Italian, I think. Um, we definitely have one in Japanese and in Korean and in Chinese. So we've really started to branch out if you want to improve your practice and you aren't physically close to a trainer. So these are possibilities. I do Skype, uh, Skype uh, coaching and stuff like that. So there's ways to do this, right, if, you, if this is important and interesting to you. So that brings us up to time. Um, I didn't get a chance to do all the other cool stuff, but hey. So I'd like to ask you a question. What thing, well, three questions. I'd like you to say three things about this. What most surprised you? Well, two things we'll do. What are you most likely to put in place, if anything, in your practice? Just those two things. What most surprised you about these three hours? And what are you most likely to put in place in your practice if you're going to put anything in place? Anybody got something to say about that? Yeah. Well, what most surprised me is that it, it, it's an attitude more than something that takes three hours of time. This, as you said, can be done even if you're standing in the hallway and you only have two minutes. Mm -hmm. And what am I most likely to put into practice? I think I'm, I'm going to try to, to start doing it in the first place. What exactly I'm going to try, I'm not sure yet, but cool. it'll come. Great. Thank you. Yeah. I realize that when you don't ask questions, it's the beginning of listening. And I think I will never forget this. That's amazing. Thank you so much for that. That's fantastic. What I realized about questions not too long ago is that they are always our own agenda and never the other person's. Think about that. Somebody else who'd like to say one thing they'd like to try, one thing they were surprised by. Is there something that you're going to try when you leave here? Everything. Oh, cool. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. Okay, improving listening. Great. Well, thank you. Yeah, I usually leave, my, my intention at the end is to leave the door open. As long as the door is open, I feel okay. If they choose left, if they choose right, if they choose to stay in the same place, that's not my interest so much, but the door is open. Yeah, uh, I was thinking that in terms of um, the SKY system and training um, primary care providers, we talk about modifying their goals for the consultation um, and there is this kind of imperative to get kids made, like jabbed, right? Mm -hmm. So um, actually I think I'm going to uh, link arms with Margie and, and try and see if we can bring our colleagues to a point where we can make it, we can give for our providers' permission to leave the conversation or to leave the consultation, um, like without that really direct plan of action, possibly sometimes okay. under certain strict conditions in certain, you know. Sure, sure. If you're going to do that, I really recommend this last question of, you know, what might make you change your mind? Yeah, right. 
It's a, it's a good one. Yeah. Marty? I have, I guess I'm pleasantly surprised that although I can see it would take a lot of practice to become very good at this, that's actually not as hard as I thought it was, perhaps, that the steps are actually quite simple. And I like the concept that you can put the building blocks and start building your practice and trying to get better at it. So, um, uh, But I would like to maybe just disagree a little bit with the end. I don't think, personally, in a clinical scenario, I think if your final question for step five is, you know, have I, has this information been able to answer your questions? And the parent says, well, yes. I don't know whether you would agree that that could, is an okay question at the end, or has this information been helpful to... It is, but it doesn't lead them forward. And it doesn't give you the information you need. Yes, it's been helpful. So what? Or well, no, that's what I'm about to say. So then I would then say... So, or something like that. Has, that, has that been helpful to address what you were worried about or to, right. to the, you know, sure. I've got the mm -hmm. top two and they say, mm -hmm. actually, yeah, that, that today has been really helpful. Then I would say, so how do you feel about making a decision to vaccinate? And they'd say, oh yeah. And I'd say, well, would you like to get started today? Okay. Because you've got to remember, that we're still clinicians, we're still yeah. speaking with parents, we're trying to get them towards vaccination. Absolutely. We can't leave it so open that we say, well, look, you go away and think about that and make another appointment to go back to your GP. Or You'll be surprised how very infrequently that happens. People will say, yes, this has moved me, or no, it hasn't. And yes, I want to vaccinate today without you asking them? Possibly. But I what, think but we if need they to but no wait 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 hold on but if they say yes I think I'm more open to that you're going to say tell me more about how you're how you're thinking about it now what's changed for you and you're going to explore that and then you're going to start leading them towards action we didn't get anywhere near that today there's yeah. a whole other I process I guess that's the bridge I'm wondering Absolutely. how you do if, that because I try at the end of my yeah, consultation to yeah. bridge them to action. Right. So briefly what you would do is you would say, okay, so you're interested now in possibly looking forward to that. What do you think is your first step? Okay. So and then much you're, more open. Yeah. And you're going to lead them through that because it seems more efficient, but if you are abrupt with people, they'll back up. Right. Yeah, and sure. then you'll miss your opportunity. And if you're lucky, they'll come back for another round, but not always. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So Not sure I can answer it, but yeah. Well, one of the models that we're looking at doing in an intervention that we're planning mm -hmm. is a pivot. So we start, because there's another approach to vaccination that, that shows success, that's the absolute opposite of this, which is a very presumptive, hey, we're going to do this, and it's almost an opt-out model. Okay. And so what we're thinking of is starting with that, because we're not going to assume that everyone that walks in and, and is being seen in this scenario is hesitant. Right. So we're starting with a presumptive approach, and then if we, we get cues that the person is hesitant or unhappy, then the plan was to like do a pivot and then start to ha have this rotational interviewing. But I'm wondering, based on what we've learned today, is there any concern that starting out with that presumptive didactic, this is what's happening approach, suddenly like puts the person offside to make them less responsive to when you become more nice and caring? Here's what I think might happen. For people who are ready to do it, it's not going to make any difference. Again, it's the phone book. They're ready. The people who are hesitant might make them more hesitant because you're pushing them into the go position and they are in the I'm not sure I want to go and it's going to push them into the stop position. So what you might start with instead is are you ready to vaccinate today? That's very direct. All the people who are ready will say, yes, 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 I am. And for the people who are like, I'm not sure, then you pivot. That would be my suggestion. You think about that. I don't know if it fits in your, in your model. I think it's less likely to polarize. You get back to me about it. Anything else to wrap it up? Anybody else would like to say what they were surprised by and what they'd like to try? Well, I would like to thank you very much for your active participation at the end of your conference, the invitation, the beautiful setting, the whole thing has been just delightful. And I have rarely met a group of such open, sweet human beings. So thank you so much for talking to me and letting me hang out with you. I really, really appreciate it. And I hope you all go back to wherever you came from and think a little bit about am I perhaps. If anybody needs cards, I have a whack of them. Don't hesitate. Come up and ask for them. And again, my thanks for the invitation, and I hope to see some of you again.
Take care. I just want to show you my last picture here. Whoopsie, just missed it. That was from last night. Off the back there. <laughs> Thank you. I think it was your fault. Didn't, didn't you say, oh, everybody's taking pictures? And I went, oh, I've got to get one too? Yeah, I did that. <laughs> Yes, 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 Hi everybody, I promised to keep this brief because I'm sure the lake and the great outdoors are calling. So it's a bit of a tradition at these uh, events that someone from the organising committee wraps up and Angus said last night, who's it going to be? And I said, it sounds like it's going to be you. And he said, no, it's going to be you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so here I am. So, so generally what we do is just have a quick whip through of um, what we've, and it is going to be quick, of what we've covered in the meeting this year and um, just... I will reflect on some, some take-homes for me from each of the sessions and uh, it gives you, I guess, a, something to take away with you and reflect upon um, what you've experienced while you've been here as well. Um, so the first, um, yeah, the, the first night we, we got here, um, after our welcome, uh, we, we were treated to the wonderful speech from Jo. Um, the Monday night presentations, the keynotes are always um, designed, I guess, to get us thinking about the, the tone of the meeting and um, the ideas that we hope to explore as a group. And um, I know a lot of what Joe said resonated with a lot of us, particularly because uh, we went on to hear it in subsequent presentations. And certainly for me, um, that slide in which she put up the kind of processes that her um, her department uses and people commenting and really being moved by the centrality of having surveillance of attitudes and um, communication and those things being parts of uh, the work of running immunisation programs that never stop and that we can never stop. And that I think was the lovely, a shadow sounds like a bad word, but that was the lovely kind of resonating bell, if you like, that, that rang out through the rest of the conference or the meeting as, as, we, as we thought about all the other things that we do. So then it was time for the rapid fires and um, of course they were quick and intense and, and wonderful. Um, we heard from Dorothy about um, the, how to respond to vocal vaccine deniers and uh, the organising committee has already spoken to Dorothy about coming back next year and having this same kind of window that Rachel has had with us. So now we're all, uh, I won't say skilled in motivational interviewing, but perhaps uh, feeling more confident and aware of the techniques and, and maybe after next year we will also be ready to um, go out in public and debate vaccine deniers. So that's the hope. Um, Harvey introduced us to a study looking at vaccine hesitancy in a non-Western setting and that's still something quite novel at this meeting. So that was, that was a really you know, interesting and useful exercise for us. Um, Saad took us on a very, yeah, entertaining and interesting and inspiring reminder of all the many, many cognitive biases that are working on us all the time and how we can think about that in the context of vaccination. And then um, Jess reminded us that it's so important to think about what exactly we want to measure. And uh, yeah, Jess, you made measurement interesting and engaging and got us really thinking about that. So thank you. 
Uh, then Nina and Angus both shared with us um, strategies for, for primary care and communication. It was great to have those two presentations back to back, one that's been developed in Australia and the other that's been developed for a more international audience. Um, and hopefully they've both been able to get feedback from people at the meeting. So then we had the social marketing session and that seemed uh, to really kind of ignite people and there was a bit of disagreement in the room which was always fun and entertaining. Um, Suzanne gave us a wonderful overview of what social marketing is and how it works which I think was, was filling a real gap in this meeting. Um, I particularly enjoyed Doug's um, concept of pulling people in. I think I'll, I'll go away and think about that further. The idea that what good marketing does, even if it's evil marketing, but certainly the marketing we want to do, of, of drawing people in to, to what you have to offer. And not necessarily at the moment you want to offer it, but what does it take to actually draw them in more generally? And then Clarissa um, gave us a wonderful example of social marketing in practice. Uh, the next session was um, how do we support healthcare workers to foster trust in vaccination? So we started with, um, with John. And uh, his, his beautiful take home for me from that was this idea of feeling felt. And um, Eugenius <laughs> made the <laughs> rather kind of confronting question of, well, you know, why do you think people didn't respond to your presentation? But I, I don't think it was because it didn't move us. I think maybe it was because it did move us and it was the kind of thing we need to reflect on further and think about how that implicates the work that we do. Um, then um, we heard from Arnold about promo vac to promo vacqua to promo vac with a big C and just and then Emmy and so just so exciting to hear about particularly for us Australians who are looking to do something similar so exciting to hear about how an idea that some of us heard last year is is growing and being implemented so that's a that's a real treat to have heard that um, then then it was my session and um, so I was really excited to have the, the three speakers and was really pleased that uh, wonderful Cindy could make Pierre Luigi almost in the room uh, from, from his home in Italy. Um, and I, you know, I can't speak without bias about the session, but I certainly enjoyed it and found it useful and hope that you did as well. Um, from there, we, we then slept and then this morning um, <laughs> we looked at, at, at some of us slept. Some of us didn't really sleep very much, to be honest. Um, not naming anybody. Um, so, <laughs> so then the, the then today, our last day was um, looking at, um, I guess, a more translational and policy focus, at least uh, in the morning. Um, so we heard from Margie, and it was. Um, you know, in a way, we heard from Arnold the previous day about sort of, you know, a project that is well now into implementation right from its early days. But to hear from Margie, the early part of that, the planning and, and the kind of level of diligence that goes into being ready to roll something out, I think was a nice sort of, you know, here's one I prepared earlier and then here's how you actually do it as well. So it was nice to have those presentations. Um, it was great to hear from um, Monique, the actual, the policy makers perspective and the kind of considerations that go into what governments decide to do and how they decide to do it. And finally, Brent's presentation was, was illuminating and interesting and fun. And Brent's obviously a hugely engaging speaker and has a really interesting history. Um, but, you know, thinking from analogous cases are always really useful. So I, I hope that you all got as much out of that as I did as well. Then we had the workshop um, to think about evidence-informed policies and practice. And, and, and that was nice. And I, I think maybe, I don't know how the other people felt, but that, you know, the report backs are good, but the time we had actually standing around a table talking were, were really good. And you're never going to quite sort of necessarily be able to share that with the room, but the, I, I feel like with those workshops, the, the, the doing was actually the real lesson and the real engagement. Um, but of course, one group impressed us immensely by making a fantastic PowerPoint show as well and yeah, blowing the rest of us off the stage. Uh, but it was obviously great to hear what, what all of the groups had, had worked through there. And then uh, finally, we were treated to um, the training from, from Rachel Green about motivational interviewing. 
And this was something that I had been particularly keen to um, to bring to this um, this meeting, knowing firstly that for the Australians it's it's something that's on our agenda, knowing that for the um, Quebecois um, it's it's something that they are are doing already, and and always trying to think about um, what kind of take home value can we give to people that come to this meeting. And um, so, so I hope that you all found that as useful as I did, and I think you did. And I want to quote Harvey here because it was beautiful. So I'm going to say it again. If you don't ask questions, that's the beginning of listening. And I will never forget this. So um, the take homes that we have from, from motivational interviewing, I think are, are two key tools that we can use. One, to give information. Evoke, provide, evoke. So one thing we can go away and try. And the other, of course, this reflective listening. And I think the exciting thing about that is we can do that with our friends and family. We, can, we don't have to be waiting till there's someone whose information, you know, someone who we want to impart inf information to. This is something we can do to be like better and nicer and more uh, you know, compassionate and valuable friends and family members. So I'm, I'm really excited to have those skills as well. So that brings me to the end of the sum up and um, on behalf of the organising committee I would like to thank um, Cindy and the team here for their as always incredible hospitality, the chef, the, uh, the people who arranged the room, the, the, the wait staff, the people who've you know kept our rooms tidy. So thank you to, to everyone here who's taken such beautiful care of us and really given us a wonderful time. And I'd like to thank the other members of the organising committee for the wonderful work that they've done um, in putting this meeting together. Um, and just a couple of comments about that. So, um, and, and just about this, this, this group, this community of practice, as we've, we've started to refer to it this year. Um, there's a concept of community of practice of people who are doing the same thing. And we're an interdisciplinary community of practice, which is... I think a really quite magical and special thing because we can always be learning from each other. This is my third time at this meeting and it's my first time on the organising committee and um, my first meeting was uh, four years ago and I feel like I have grown up so much in that time as a researcher and as someone who can uh, contribute to the field and what's been really exciting is how much the field has grown. So I, I, I was talking um, with Jess, you were saying you were born in, the, like you were the same age as Harry Potter. Oh, right. Yes, so, so Je Jess was um, the same age as Harry Potter when the Harry Potter books came out. And yeah, I feel a little bit like that. It, probably I was born a little later as, as a researcher, but to, to come into this field and grow with it has just been such an incredible thing for me. And this meeting and this community of practice has really been everything to do with that. Um, yeah, it, it, I can't underestimate how significant that that has been. And just as it has been for me, I know it has been for so many other people in this room. And if this is your first time, then I hope that it will something that, be something that can continue to be that for you as well. Um, so the organising committee has, um, this year we've kind of, you know, individuals championed particular themes and particular sessions and put them together. We would, you will have an opportunity for an evaluation, I think. Is this true, Cindy, that evaluations will go out? Yes. She's sending them. So, so please tell us um, you know, what, what you liked and in particular what you would like to have next time that wasn't included this time and we will do our very best to, to make that happen for you. Um, and we'd, we'd really, yeah, we would really like to know from you how we can populate these meetings with, with useful and helpful speakers and training and um, you know, conversations and sessions. Um, and the final thing that I want to say is that um, we, we will be um, having a meeting again next year. The, the, the timing might be slightly different. This is going to be determined soon and we will let everybody know. But one of the ways, in fact, you know, one of the only ways people know about this meeting is um, through hearing about it through their networks. So anyone that's ever been to the meeting will, will receive an email. And what we would really ask of you so that we can continue to grow, so our community of practice continues to grow, is that when you receive those emails, that you push them out to your networks in your country, or not just in your country, but in your discipline and your, um, your specific community of practice. Um, so that we ha that we have people here who are not just you know that we could so we can hear about presenters people would like to hear from, but also just you know for the people who are here that didn't present, 
you know, having you in the room, having you as part of the sessions, um, hearing your contributions, having the opportunities to collaborate with you. We would like people to continue to see this as an opportunity to come and be part of something. So, um, so please, yeah, when, when, when you hear about the next meeting, please, please consider coming, of course, and, and please share that information with your peers. So on that note, I think that is the end of my speech. I don't think I've forgotten to thank anybody. And so I'd just like to thank all of you so much for, for making this a truly wonderful meeting. And I hope to see many or all of you at the next one. Thank you. Thank you.